Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to San Francisco. Uh, the Beatles music has ended, which means it's time for the plenary one session uh, focused on translational medicine. I'm Lee Ellis, Vice Chair for Translational Medicine. James Ray, my friend and partner in crime, is Executive Officer for Translational Medicine, and we're happy to be back and happy to see such a good crowd. I hope you enjoyed, uh, for those who attended the Omics Symposium this morning, I hope you enjoyed the symposium. I think it was quite revealing. We have our colleagues and friends um, exhibiting for the next two days, uh, or at least till Friday afternoon, so have, take a chance uh, give yourself a chance to talk to our colleagues out there and see if there's a way that we can enhance our research uh, through uh, various omics platforms. So they will be out there, like I said, until tomorrow afternoon about 5 o'clock. Uh, this is Plenary One uh, based on TM. We have a great lineup today. Uh, you see we have, uh, after my introduction, my boring introduction, we have three outstanding talks. And I just am so happy that Megan agrees with me that the Beatles are the greatest ever, and this is part of her, her talk. So I just had to throw that up there as an introduction, that it's nice to have friendly people who recognize the best talent in the world. These are our disclosures. I will make sure I keep this up there for more than one millisecond, as is usually the case. OK, everybody see it? OK, we're being honest. And I want to take a couple minutes to go through some opportunities. If you uh, are interested in taking uh, pictures of the screen uh, for the opportunities coming up, please pull out your cameras right now. So I'll give you a second to do that. We'll begin with, uh, as always, the wonderful Hope Foundation celebrating 30 years of supporting SWAG. You can see there are a number of grant opportunities coming up with deadlines coming up relatively quickly. And of course, you can write a grant in two weeks. We all know we can do that. Uh, there's another deadline, seed grant uh, July 1, uh, impact award letters of intent July 1, and a deadline has been extended for the Coltman Fellowship until September 1. So grab your picture if you're interested in this or go to the website, the Hope Foundation at the top, or the, the website's listed at the top. And then Hope at 30. This is an anniversary. Uh, it's uh, absolutely wonderful. I think so many of us have been uh, uh, benefited in our careers and our research, and hopefully this translates to patients and trainees uh, with the support of the Hope Foundation. I myself want to thank uh, Morgan and Joe and the Hope team for helping out with this uh, Omics Symposium today. I think it, it went really well, and we certainly could not have pulled this off without the help of the Hope Foundation. So they are multi-talented in multiple di different disciplines, and when needed, they are there to help. So uh, I want to say let's give a round of applause to the Hope Foundation. <laughs> Just can't thank you enough for doing all you do for SWAG and, in turn, our patients. And having said that, Hope Foundation uh, requires uh, leadership, and there are opportunities to join the Hope Board. If you're interested, please take a picture of this slide or, or visit the um, Hope exhibit right out front uh, to uh, my left as you enter into the, um, into the atrium out there. And with that, I think it's time for me to end my comments. We have a wonderful and very diverse uh, group of speakers today. Uh, we'll start with uh, Meghna Trevetti, uh, who's from the uh, Herbert Irving CCC, or Comprehensive Cancer Center at Columbia University. This will be followed by uh, a translational medicine talk by our translational medicine chair for leukemia, uh, Jerry Radich, the Kurt um, Enslein Endowed Chair from the Hutch. And then the last talk, uh, also coming from Seattle, is from Megan Othis, the inspiration for Come Together Today collaborating with statisticians for productive translational medicine in SWAG. So with that, I invite Magda up here to um, tell us about your support from the Hope Foundation. Thank you so much for the invitation today to speak about uh, my work founded by, uh, funded by the Hope Foundation, uh, talking about building a career in personalized cancer care through SWOG. I have no conflicts. 
So the Hope Foundation Charles Coatman Jr. Fellowship Award is a two-year award honoring the legacy of longtime SWAG chair and leader Dr. Coltman. The purpose of the award is to support and engage early career investigators from SWAG institutions in learning clinical trial methodology and to ultimately develop an independent clinical research career. I was awarded the Coltman Fellowship for my work on S1714 a prospective observational cohort study to develop a predictive model of taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy in patients with cancer. Some brief background on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, or CIPN. It's a side effect that we see with several antineoplastic agents and can present as sensory, motor, or autonomic symptoms. There remain several challenges with CIPN. First, there are numerous methods for assessing CIPN, including clinician assess measures, patient reported outcome measures, as well as objective measures or with neurosensory testing like the tuning fork and neuropen. However, there's no standardized approach for assessing and reporting CIPN in clinical trials as well as in the clinic. Uh, the mechanism, phenotype, and trajectory of CIPN are not well understood, and therefore there are limited options for prevention and treatment of CIPN. There is also a lack of validated and clinically useful biomarkers, so it is difficult to predict who will develop CIPN. Right currently, the mainstay of managing CIPN is dose reduction, dose modifications in the form of dose reductions or discontinuation of chemotherapy, and ultimately this can affect patient outcomes. For cancer survivors, the development of neuropathy can lead to significant impact on the quality of life. To individualize care, to individualize patient care, there is a need to identify predictors of CIPN in order to maximize therapeutic effect and minimize toxicity. SWOG S1714 was developed in response to the, to the symptom, uh, to the CIPN clinical trials planning management meeting held by the NCI in 2017. This prospective observational cohort study of patients receiving taxane-based chemo, taxane chemotherapy regimens for stage one through three uh, small, non-small cell lung cancer, breast or ovarian cancer. Over the course of three years, we collected patient-reported outcome measures, including the CIPN20, NCI CTCAE measures for neuro neuro neuropathy symptoms, as well as biospecimen collection in order to build a biospecimen uh, repository. We also conducted objective testing with neuropen and tuning fork testing, as well as functional testing with the time to get up and go. The primary objective of S1714 is to develop a clinical risk prediction model for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathies that can be applied in the clinic setting. Between March 2019 and November 2021, which happened to overlap with the peak of the COVID pandemic, we were able to accrue over 1,300 patients at over 100 institutions in the United States and Latin America. This slide outlines many of the, the objectives of 1714 in order to better characterize CIPN by collecting data on assessment and evaluation methods, the trajectory and natural history of CIPN, to try and identify the risk factors and predictors for CIPN, as well as to develop a biospecimen repository. Given the scope and scale of this trial, it required multidisciplinary expertise and allowed me to form collaborations with investigators from across many institutions as well as within the SWOG network. For example, we did develop a translational medicine objectives for this study with our translational medicine uh, chair, Dr. Daniel Hertz, to look at pharmacokinetic and pharmacogenomic predictors of CIPN. The ultimate goal of this work is to try to individualize cancer treatment and to develop novel interventions for prevention and treatment of CIPN. After completing accrual to this study in November of 2021, we presented the baseline characteristics of our S1714 cohort at the ASCO 2022 annual meeting. Of the 1,300 eligible, uh, over 1,300 eligible patients, we had a very racially and ethnically diverse cohort of primarily women, uh, primarily females with breast cancer. Additionally, we looked at the various me uh, methods of baseline neuropathy assessment, including the baseline patient uh, assessed PRO CTCAE for numbness and tingling, as well as various categories of the clinician assessed CTCAE for neuropathic symptoms. We found that in the patient-reported outcome measures, up to 25% of patients reported mild or higher development of numbness and tingling. When we looked at the, the clinician assess measures, there was no category that had more than 12% grade one to three assessments. 
This data suggests that physicians may underestimate symptoms reported by patients and requires further investigation. We then looked at the breast cancer cohort enrolled to 1714 and looked at the incidence and persistence of CIPN in these patients. We found that at any point over the one year period, two out of three patients experienced clinically significant or clinically meaningful sensory neuropathy. And by one year, almost 50% of patients had some clinically meaningful sensory neuropathy. Long-term follow-up at 104 as well as 156 weeks will help us better characterize the long-term traje long trajectory of CIPN. Coming up this, uh, this annual ASCO meeting in June, we will be presenting as an oral abstract uh, looking at CIPN uh, due to paclitaxel versus docetaxel in the patients with early stage breast cancer receiving taxane therapy. So we hope that you'll join us to hear those results. Uh, building on the work Dr. Hertz and I had together on S1714, we submitted a R01 proposal in, shortly after the completion of enrollment to S1714. Uh, this proposal was entitled Development of an Integrated Risk Prediction Model of Taxane Induced Peripheral Neuropathy, and it was successfully awarded an R37 Merit Award at the end of 2022 with funding starting January of this year. There are three aims to this study. The first is to assess the predictive value of key nutrients and lipids in TIPN risk. The second is to determine genetic features that contribute to TI TIPN risk uh, using GWAS. And the third is to develop an integrated model, prediction model, using the findings from AIMS 1 and 2 and integrating them into the clinical risk prediction model that's developed as the primary objective for S1714. Through our work together on S1714, we were able to establish this multi-PI uh, R37 uh, award, and we look forward to continuing to work on that and presenting those results. So over the six years from when DCP approved this concept back in November 2017, uh, we have been able to successfully complete uh, accrual of over 1,300 patients to S1714 despite the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and have been able to present preliminary results at three, uh, at three conferences from these findings. The Coltman funding period supported me and allowed me to establish uh, uh, knowledge and training in clinical trials methodology over the enrollment period of this study. And shortly after the completion of the Coltman funding, I was able to successfully uh, submit and achieve, with the help of my translational medicine chair, uh, Dr. Hertz, a successful R37 funding to allow us to foster independent research. So through studies like S1714, we're making a lot of progress in cancer care in identifying predictors for treatment toxicity, benefit from therapy, and risk of cancer development or recurrence. And the goal of all of this is to be able to provide a personalized approach to cancer treatment, supportive care, and cancer prevention. An important challenge here is to be able to translate all of these findings to the broader community and allow for delivery of this, these treatments and novel precision medicine options to our patients in all communities and settings. And this is where cancer care delivery and that research takes place. And so through my experience with S1714, I was able to work with other investigators and committees, including the Cancer Care Delivery Research Committee, to develop another clinical trial entitled S2108CD, a cluster randomized trial comparing an educationally enhanced genomic tumor board or EGTB intervention to usual practice to increase evidence-based genome-informed therapy. In collaboration with my co-study chair, Dr. Jens Ruder from the Jackson Labs, we uh, are implementing an uh, intervention that includes a structured genomic tumor board in combination with educational materials for, the, for physicians. The, in this cluster randomized trial, we have 18 recruitment centers from the NCOR that are randomized to either receive the in intervention or to practice um, usual care. The study was activated in August of 2022, and to date we have completed over a quarter of 25% of the accrual with over 300 patients accrued. And with that, I will stop and, and have my acknowledgments. I'd most importantly like to thank the Hope Foundation for their support through the Coltman Award, and additionally, they provided uh, STRS funds for S2108, the Genomic Tumor Board Study. Um, my mentors, the research teams, all of the trial participants, and of course, the grant funding.
That was uh, impressive and right on time in addition to that. I will state to those folks, there are about 68 people, 74 people online. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat box and I will see if we have time to uh, raise that question. Let me first uh, look around and see if there's anybody by a microphone. The lights are pretty bright. If anybody's by a microphone, feel free to speak out, speak up. And there's Dan Hayes. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I'm intrigued by your last slide. Dan Hayes, University of Michigan. Um, I'm intrigued by your last slide. What's the intervention that you're going to introduce to the sites in your randomized trial? Sorry, so going back to this slide. Yes, so the intervention is actually a combination of a structured virtual genomic tumor board in combination with educational materials that are delivered through online modules. So in the intervention arm, um, physicians, through the recruitment centers, there's three levels. So there's the recruitment center, there's the physician participants, and the patient participants. Um, physician participants will enroll their patients who are undergoing genomic testing. And in the intervention arm, all of those patients will be presented at this structured, structured virtual tumor board and discussed with um, by genomic experts, and the treating physicians will receive a report of minutes, and they're able to attend those meetings as well. So that's the intervention that's being um, administered. Anybody else at the microphone? So I'll, I'll bring up one issue, um, which is a very hot topic these days, which is diversity. And in your <clears throat> original trial, you showed the data uh, that you had nice diversity throughout the trial. As you plan this trial, is, are there going to be interim stopping points so you can assess whether or not you are accruing a diverse uh, population uh, and then you would be able to act upon that to try to increase the diversity? That's a really great point, and this was really important as we were selecting our recruitment centers for the study. We really wanted to make sure that we had a diverse population, um, and so we prioritized enrolling minority um, MUN corps as well as rural N corps as well. So uh, there was a fairly <laughs> elaborate application process. We had interviews with each recruitment center that applied in order to try and make sure that we um, diversified our patient population, and, and you know we will be keeping track of both the physician and patient population participants and their characteristics in order to ensure diversity. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Okay. Congratulations on all the papers, <laughs> the grants, and the progress, and most importantly, for helping our patients. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <clears throat> So now we move to our translational medicine uh, chair talk. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Jerry Radich uh, from the Hutch, or Fred Hutch, it's in uh, cancer, uh, give us an overview of what's going on in translational medicine within the Leukemia Committee. His title, uh, the title of his uh, presentation today is A Brief History of Time and Effort. So this should be very interesting. Great, thanks everyone. Um, welcome, I'm Jerry. Um, Megan was going to pay me 20 bucks to walk on the stage with bare feet like Paul McCartney, but 20 bucks isn't enough to have anyone look at my ugly feet. Um, so as they say, now for something completely different. Um, so what we do in uh, translational medicine is really summarized um, by this uh, one figure here. I'll use this side. Um, this is really the kind of the glide path of any cancer, political leukemia. You, you start a diagnosis with a lot of disease, you push down here, and at some point you become undetectable by conventional methods, and you either go into remission or go into relapse. And so these are what we call the three R's of, of, of cancer response, resistance, and relapse. And um, if one slide could summarize like two decades or more of translational medicine leukemia, this is it, uh, which either shows great focus or is sort of sad and pathetic, you can, you can be the call on that. Um, because what we try to do here is, is look at markers of diagnosis that are going to teach you what glide path you're on, and then develop sensitive methods that when you look like you're in remission to the conventional pathologist, we can decide whether you're going to relapse or going to remission. And then the last final thing is, can you use these type of triggers of so-called MRD, minimal residual disease, to be actually endpoints for clinical studies? So we sort of have a, a, a multi-pronged approach. One is that we have uh, 
investigational labs to do the R&D work. This has primarily been at the Hutch, but also has uh, some of my colleagues uh, in the Alliance and, and now at City of Hope also contribute. But the idea there is to work on the kind of the, really the wet lab R&D work. And then we have at the Hutch um, a kind of a spin-off of that. We have a molecular oncology CLIA lab, which I think is probably unique in the country, um, is that all we do are clinical trials. So we do clinical trials for the intergroups, we do clinical trials for pharma, we do clinical trials for local institutions, no pa actual standard patient care, just clinical trial issues. And so we can do rapid turnaround time. So for instance, for the COG trial that's down here, we do all the COG testing for leukemia. We get the leukemia markers uh, to them within uh, two days. For the CML trials, the average turnaround time in our lab is 0.7 days. So it's all geared on doing high volume, rapid um, molecular testing. These are the trials that we are supporting right now in that uh, trial in our uh, network. These are ones that are kind of coming up and we'll spend some time talking about myeloma match in a moment. But also I just highlight some of the things that are going on in the labs that are contributing to the science. Um, this is from uh, Derek's uh, uh, lab. Um, there's a number of things he's done over the last couple years, a, a lot with biomarkers comparing proteomics to uh, genetic tests, RNA, uh, mRNA, and uh, DNA mutations and the like, trying to understand how proteomics um, maps with gene mutations so you can develop, again, new biomarkers and potentially new drug targets. Uh, this plot up above here is looking at a volcano plot at gene expression and comparing patients if you take their total leukemic samples versus taking selective early progenitor cells, uh, demonstrating that actually better targets for uh, both diagnostics, uh, monitoring, and drug targets potentially is found in a more isolated population, which has some uh, push on how we might be doing um, targeted um, diagnostics in the future. Um, this goes to a point that for the solid tumor people out there may have uh, really uh, fairly big value. This is what we get, this is a meta-analysis of uh, so-called MRD and AML, showing that by flow cytometry mostly, if you're MRD negative at the end of induction, you do a lot better than MRD positive, where flow cytometry to detect roughly one in 1,000 to one in 10,000 will keep the cells in the back of normal cells. But obviously what you'd really like to do in a test is actually pull these curves apart, right? That would be what you'd really need to really base clinical trials on it. So that if you're MRD positive, you know you're gonna relapse. If you're MRD negative, you know you're gonna be safe. So the issue is, can you build a better mousetrap to do that? And how we're doing that is by a spin-off company that, that from uh, the university in the Fred Hutch called uh, Twin Strands, but the technology is something called duplex sequencing. So everything in diagnostics, especially when you're doing minimal residual disease and the like, it's all issue like life itself. It's signal and noise, right? And that's a whole thing we deal with. Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. It's all noise, there's no signal. Same is true when you start following cancer, right? You basically have a needle in a haystack. You're trying to find a leukemic cell in a mass of millions of normal cells. So what this is, this curve is basically looking at log differences in signal to noise. And so if you imagine that here you've got basically no signal, here you've got what basically Sanger sequencing is, which is once you get below 10% tumor contamination, you can't see the signal. And then if you pick up to about one in 10 to the thousand, you find out the signal, right? It's, it's Darwin. This is an example of it. Uh, in the top right panel. So the problem with most conventional sequencing is when you build the libraries and, and uh, make those by amplification, there's an error rate in the polymerases. That's usually about one in a thousand. So you can never really get past the sensitivity to one in a thousand without getting background error. So what duplex sequencing is doing is very simple. It makes libraries off of both strands. And you only make a mutation call where you have complementary base pair in both strands. So that brings your sensitivity down to one times 10 to the three to time one times 10 to the three times the complementary uh, ACGT changes. So roughly about one in 10 to the seventh is the limit of detection. So on the top right panel is, is a patient who has the T31I mutation in CML, which is a kind of a classic high resistance mutation done by conventional sequencing. And you see that if you get down here to about 5%, 1%, every base pair in that sequence has a mutation, right? If down here is by doing duplex sequence, you basically eliminate the background. So we've now done this, we've developed myeloid panels to do this for about 29 different genes, 
then ask the question is, if you look at samples and compare it to conventional sequencing or conventional flow cytometry measures of MRD, how's it look? So this is looking at 70 swag patients. Um, and the, the key thing to look at is the two by two table. When I was a grad student, I was in, uh, my mentor told me that basically, I was in epidemiology, that all of life's experiences can be compressed into a two by two table. It's, it's pretty accurate if you actually try it. Um, and so what this looks at is flow positive or negative versus duplex sequencing positive or negative. And you find that there's a pretty high concordance, but about 25% of the cases, you pick up mutation, you pick up residual disease by mutations that you don't find by flow. All right, so that's fine, but what happens? So this is looking at relative risks of, and you see flow is about two and a half fold. If you pick up uh, flow positivity, your relapse or survival. And then on the, on the left column here is various ways to define residual disease um, based on what the frequency of mutation you find, what mutation you find, et cetera, because we're trying to model that for our next kind of validation study. And what you find is if you look at time to relapse or relapse for your survival, um, duplex sequencing is about twice as good a flow. And so we think this has got uh, a fair amount of promise in going forward and really uh, using it to define treatment outcomes and patient um, um, treatment strategies. And we're, again, we're doing a larger validation studies in, this, in SWOG now to see whether this holds out. So next I wanna talk a little bit about our efforts in uh, Broadway and AML. Um, so AML, unfortunately, is a fairly heterogeneous disease, but not as much as solid tumors. Like the average AML patient has somewhere around three mutations, so it's not like a lung cancer that has scores and scores of mutations. So it's doable. And there's now a cottage industries uh, that basically define risks based on cytogenetics and mutations. But we're pretty lousy in doing this, because if you look at our survival, if you look at SEER data from 1980 and compare us, uh, death rates in the US for AML till now, they haven't budged. So the question is, what are we doing wrong? Can we be more thoughtful in how to use new drugs and, and new molecular monitoring techniques to make a difference in survival? So this is, again, just an example of now, AML is like a bazillion different diseases. So how do you make head or sense of it? So this brings us to the whole MyoMatch program of precision medicine. So this is kind of what, when people talk about precision medicine, this is kind of what people think about, and this is kind of what I used to think about is it's, it's a very easy way to do the elevator pitch. You've got a sick patient here. You generate data. That's what we do, genetic data, et cetera. Then from that, you pick a drug, and then they're happy, right? So this is, again, this is kind of the, the kind of simplistic way I even thought about it. Um, and it reminds me of another thing I learned in grad school is my mentor used to tell me is that uh, confidence is the feeling you have before you understand something. <laughs> so I was confident that, that we could do this in, in very quickly. Um, and this just reminds me that to my pet peeve is that precision medicine is a terrible term. This is precision. All the arrows are clumped together. It's not near the target. So the byline of precision medicine is that we're reproducibly wrong, right? Or as Maynard Key said here, I'd rather be vaguely right than precisely wrong. So what's in a word? A lot. So myelomatch, Harry talked about this before. It's, it's, it's mostly genetic-driven protocol assignments. They're going to be predominantly phase two trials based on flow cytometry. And we're looking at flow as being the endpoint with hopefully some of these new technologies being a better endpoint in the future. This is sort of the setup where we've got multiple tier groups, which are really based on how much disease you've got, kind of your upfront tier uh, one trials, tier two for people who have residual disease, so-called you know, eraser trials, then on with transplantation trials, and looking at f down the road trials where you look at molecular characteristics of the minimal residual disease and try to base trial design based on that. So these are the essential components um, that when you d pull that diagram apart, you get to. The information technology, which basically touches everything in ways that I had no way of anticipating. Um, getting the agents, which is another large task. Um, the modular stuff turns out to be um, at least the, probably the most straightforward part, um, and then generating the trials. So this is a wire diagram um, of basically everything that IT has to touch, from all the centers that, pro that type in patient names to getting samples out to the individual labs to those people sending data back to assigning patients, et cetera. 
right? This all has to be created. This doesn't exist. It doesn't grow itself. It's, you know, people have to write code for this. And this was, in our first presentation, the first out of eight slides. So that tells you to do this in a large, huge group setting, what a monstrosity task this is to actually pull off. Um, and then you get to um, basically the Asian Gene Committee, because what you have to do is you have targets, you have to find drug companies that have those targets, you have to find drug companies that actually want to work with us, and then you negotiate what the trial design is going to be, because some of them don't want really, you know, a lot of competition. They want to show their drugs good, so you have to kind of... And so this is a data that Rich Little pulled up to say how hard this is. Um, for each agent brought into our program, it requires over 200 hours of actual meeting time to get those contracts hammered out. And it takes 30 to 60 hours just to figure out that it's not gonna be a match. So this isn't speed dating in any way, shape, or form. This is like a really slow, onerous process. And then you get to the lab part, and so it turns out that there was enough money involved in this is that you just didn't ask for labs to do it. It was a very secretive process um, run by this company, uh, Lidos, which does government contracting. And they wouldn't tell us what they were looking for. They wouldn't tell us who they were considering. It was all done in secret. Um, I was the head of the laboratory committee, so I recused our group from doing any of this, because I thought that was unfair. Um, that didn't work, uh, and so we're doing it. Um, and so we'll have, uh, the idea here is for, to do 72 hour turnaround time for cytogenetics, flow cytometry, and this whole myeloid panel of all mutations. So really getting on it quite fast. And so um, throughout this process, I've become now an expert in writing large government contracts, uh, which I recommend to absolutely no one in the room. Um, um, this is the system we're using, which is so-called Ion Torrent, uh, now uh, owned by Th uh, Thermo Fisher. It's a panel of about 100 combinations of mutations and, tr and transcripts. Um, the ion torrent machine um, calls base pairs by s doing DNA synthesis. Depending on what base you add, you uh, fall off different amounts of protons. And so this is, is basically the world's most expensive pH meter. Um, and so it, but it can go quite rapidly. You can actually ch churn through data within a day or so. This is, now we've done all the validation work. This is looking at um, hundreds of samples between MOCA, which will do some of it, and us, where you get high reproducibilities. We've done this with orthogonal testing of different platforms. It, it actually, it works. It's pretty slick. And so I think we're, we will definitely be able to pull this out within time. Uh, the development's been, been going rapidly. Um, these are the trials co-accorded. In, in sort of a, a status, we've got three ready to go now, four ready to go, um, and all together there's what, 19 protocols that are in various shapes of the pipeline. So soon we'll be going, and we estimate that there's gonna be somewhere between two to 4,000 patients at steady state in this, in this program. Um, lastly, things that are coming soon to the SWOG trials that are in the R&D um, issues. Um, one is uh, Min Fang's group, Cecilia's group here, uh, um, our group and the like, are working on various ways to, to do more sensitive structural changes in chromosomes. Uh, much of this is called so-called the high-seq methods where you basically uh, fix chromosomes that are juxtapositioned um, and then you basically can back sequence them. And you can find small translocations that cytogenetics or fish can't pick up. So in our hands, just some preliminary data on swag samples, about half the patients that have normal cytogenetics by conventional cytogenetics have some other lesions. Uh, in some of the solid tumors, it's, it's even uh, more than that. And so there's actually a genetic bedlam that exists outside of, of what you get out of cytogenetics. You can imagine that those are real possibilities for both diagnostics and finding new targeted hotspots for drugs and the like. Uh, we're working on long-range sequencing um, s uh, systems. This nanopore system right there is about the size of an iPhone, plugs into a, a cell phone. You can do real-time sequencing um, of large parts of the genomes or multiple uh, targets. You can describe by uh, CRISPR targets. Um, and you can basically get RNA, uh, DNA sequencing done within a day. Um, we have a big program in diagnostic solutions for low- and middle-income countries. Um, right now, most of these are run off of dried blood spots where you can do RNA transcript um, or uh, large DNA panels. Um, these are nice because they can be sent by snail mail up to four months, and they work just fine. So for a lot of the places we're collaborating in, in Lumix, um, 
we actually don't need to buy expensive freezers and stuff, they can actually store their samples in a shoebox. Um, and then lastly, um, I'll be showing later on today some clinical tools we're, we're doing now that, that at the desktop, um, physicians can look at changes in clonal heterogeneity that happen with therapy and track that to treatment to get an idea of how the cancer is changing like with therapy. Because when you think about it, what cancer is now, we know, we know is it's really an ecosystem, right? There, there's multiple clones, some which compete together, some which cooperate together. You've got an immune system that's sort of like predator and prey. You've got niches, you've got food. And, and really what we're doing is basically treating an ecosystem. And to understand that, um, because right now, you know, cancer basically uses Darwinian forces against us, right? What happens when we usually treat cancer is we treat the sensitive clone goes away. That's probably not the clone that's going to kill us. Um, but it just gives more room to grow, more food to eat for the clones that are bad. So the idea is how do we basically wrestle that away from the advantage of the tumor to us? And I think that these kind of tools will help us manage therapy in real time as we can kind of progress what clonal evolution is occurring. This is my final slide. Um, this is, of course, what we want to do at diagnosis. We want to use this kind of work to drive drug uh, prognosis and what drug we're going to be using. In remission, we're going to try to change therapy use it as drug development markers, et cetera. What we want are tests that are fast, reliable, sensitive, flexible, and cheap. But as uh, Jim Jarmesh, the director, told uh, Tom Waits, who's one of my favorite musicians, um, fast, cheap, and good, pick two. Um, if it's fast and cheap, it won't be good. If it's cheap and good, it won't be fast. If it's fast and good, it won't be cheap. Fast, cheap, and good, pick two words to live by. And with that, thanks. So for those who are paying attention, there's a lot of philosophy in that talk. <laughs> so, you know, um, I have wrote down quite a bit here. <laughs> Any questions? Tear it up immediately. <laughs> Save yourself. For Dr. Radich. Come on, solid tumor people. Dig deep into your brains. So I, I'm gonna, while people are walking up to the microphone, and I'll raise an issue. <laughs> or stampeding away in the other direction. <laughs> you talked about 200 <laughs> plus hours for the development of a trial, as I recall. To, um, interacting with the drug company to get them to the trial stage. And, and I'm not being cynical, but I don't consider that a high, a very high number. Yeah, well that's, that's because to me as a lab person it seems, yeah. Yeah. So were you, go, you showing off, better, better, better. were you showing off by saying only 232 yeah, hours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a decimal point I missed. Because, you know, if David Gander is here, how long did it take for, you know, to negotiate lung match? Well, in that case, we must be a surprisingly attractive program. <laughs> Questions? Solutions? Thanks. Anything? Regrets. Okay, that was great. Thank you. Very insightful. Make sure you think a bit. Uh, and now we will uh, close out the uh, plenary one session with uh, Megan Othis. Uh, Megan, as I recall, you run the Young Investigator course, don't you? Can we give Megan a round of applause for all the effort she's put in? <laughs> 40 hands raised. Okay. So Megan will talk today about collaborating with statisticians for productive translational medicine research in SWAG. And Megan, it's all yours. Okay. Well, I'm excited to talk about a part of my job I really enjoy. But I'm going to start with my conflicts and leave them there for a couple seconds. So if you don't know me and you haven't worked with me, I'm a statistician based in Seattle, and I really enjoy designing clinical trials. 
But the analysis of clinical trials actually usually isn't that complicated or even that interesting. Because if I do a good job designing a clinical trial and I have randomized data and I've made nice forms, the analysis is actually really straightforward. So in terms of statistics, actually secondary analyses and translational medicine analyses are more interesting to me. I got a PhD in statistics and biostatistics because I like complicated data and I like problem solving there. And this is a space where there's a lot more opportunity to do that. Also, philosophically, I feel that these analyses are some of the best things we can do with our trials. That primary analysis is just going to be one paper and all of the effort of uh, the researchers to get those data and the patients volunteering to participate in the trial were really to be stewards of all of that work is to do as much as we can with it. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And as I was trying to decide how to frame my talk, my fifth grade son was learning about kind of elements of persuasive writing uh, in a five paragraph essay. And I was thinking, well, what do I find persuasive? And since I'm a statistician, I find data persuasive. So I want to try and persuade you that there are techniques that like we all know, but we should really use to help be more, protect be more productive here. And the data that I'm going to use is from a leukemia study, SO106. And it actually wasn't my study. I didn't de design it, and I didn't analyze it. I'm not a co-author even on the primary manuscript, though I've done a lot of work with this trial. And the trial's old enough that you can see that it was back when it was expensive to, pl to print uh, color Kaplan-Meier plots. So they're both black, but it doesn't matter what the colors are because they're really close together. So clearly, there wasn't a big benefit here in this trial. And the trial closed early for futility at the 2009 SWOG meeting in Chicago. And I remember that because it was my first SWOG meeting and I had you know, gotten my PhD in, in the prior June and, and shown up with this job. And I'd only gone to biostatistics scientific conferences before and the SWOG meeting just felt so overwhelming. All these committees and there are like a million acronyms and I didn't know like what anything was going on. But I remember that I remember the feelings when the, when the DSMC released the results of this trial because it was testing adding a novel therapy to our standard backbone. That novel therapy had accelerated approval and people thought they had a home run with this trial and they didn't. And what can sometimes happen when you have these trials where the outcome isn't what you wanted is you hopefully publish it and then it gets put in a drawer and nobody ever does anything with it again. But thankfully the Leukemia Committee has really made the most of this trial. So for any trial, really, you get one paper for your primary analysis. But so this, this um, and the primary paper, so the data released in 2009, people weren't in a rush to publish it, didn't come out until 2013. But you can see this sequence of up to 38 papers now, and there are more in the pipeline. So really making the most of a trial that wasn't even positive, but to try and understand and make better decisions about future trials and other areas of treatment in this. So what was going on here and what are some of the things that made this successful? And one of them was these weren't written by 38 different people, totally new to SWOG. People who got involved in this trial and in, in this research like took the time to really learn about what we had and didn't have. And one thing about SWOG is that it's not like a retrospective analysis for a secondary analysis, like at your institution, where you can have a resident or fellow go into the medical record and extract new data that then we can analyze. We either have the data or we don't. If we asked for it, we have it and it's clean, but if we don't, we don't. And so taking the time to get to know that lets a researcher then really kind of quickly pivot and see where they can use that data again for another paper. Another strategy is coming in with really specific hypotheses and objectives. If you come in with a specific hypothesis and objective, I can give you results and analyses that answer it, and then we have a paper and we're done. That's all that there needs. And this picture here is actually from Jerry. So oftentimes when I work with Jerry on a project, he leads off with sending me like an email that might say something like, I think this one said bad ideas. And it has just some like handwritten notes, but it gives me an idea of what sorts of summaries he's going to think could be helpful for him to understand the data we have to answer that question. 
question that we have. So these sorts of things, and sometimes, and I have to be honest, some of the things that Jerry asked for, we can't do. Like, we don't know that's what our data look like, Jerry. But knowing that he thought that that would be helpful helps me kind of craft the way that I summarize the data to provide it to kind of more quickly get to the point where we've answered that hypothesis and we can write that paper and go on. Another strategy like this would be if you had like a paper that you saw that somebody else published in a related or unrelated but had really nice figures and tables, if you show those to me, then I can do the, the same sort of thing. One example of a specific hypothesis that's very straightforward is using SWOG data to validate data that has already been published. So this is actually the first the first secondary analysis I ever did in SWOG. A group in Europe had found some cytogenetic abnormalities that they felt identified a particularly poor risk group of patients. That's that red curve at the bottom from the JCO paper. But they had no validation. It looks pretty bad in the Kaplan-Meier plot, but like, they didn't have any validation. And so SWOG investigators took the time and effort to create an annotated data set where we had those same markers so we could look, and we did find that we validated it. And then once they did that, work, they continue to spin off that data set and build upon it and write additional papers. And when you're going to validate, it's like pretty clear like what analyses need to be done and how that paper needs to be written to, be, to just kind of churn through it and get it out. That said, the, creating that annotated data set was the thing that took a lot of effort here. Sometimes it's the case that SWOG, that there isn't, a, that SWOG is the place where you want to identify or discover markers that you're not wanting to validate, but there's a lot, if, there's a lot of things you can look at, and so something is more believable and so more publishable if you can validate it. And so coming in, even if you want to use SWOG for discovery, understanding if there's an external cohort you can use, the Kaplan-Meier plots here are from when we use the TCA TCGA data set, we have been looking at some potentially, we wanted to see if we could identify any methylation markers that were prognostic in these patients, and then we were able to use the TCGA to check it. Sometimes SWOG has a really unique patient resource between the clinical trial data and the samples, and there really isn't an external validation set available, in which case like a split sample is going to be needed and you can like work to figure out do we actually have enough samples to do that, to do a split sample, or what are alternatives. Sometimes that external uh, validation cord is from another, from another cooperative group. Uh, with the, in the leukemia community, we work regularly with the other adult cooperative groups and also with the pediatric group in the US and also with groups outside. And this isn't just for validation, but when you have a rare cancer or even a common cancer and you're starting to look at like a molecular subgroup that isn't common, oftentimes our SWOG data just aren't big enough. Our cohort size isn't big enough to really accurately characterize that small subgroup. And so working with other groups is the way that we can get enough data to do that. And so all of this is kind of a, a message about like time and effort. So if you come in with a specific, really clear hypothesis, we can help you write a paper, like evaluate that hypothesis and write that paper really efficiently. If you come in wanting to look at everything with no clear hypothesis, no clear endpoint, then the, then the, it's not clear when we're done and it can just spin. So I showed all those papers. I also have a number of projects that have been kind of like doing iterations of just data mining for years with no publication because when you come in with no, when you come in and your question isn't that specific, it's not clear when you're done. And so, so yeah. And, and this specific one comes up maybe every like three months, somebody asks me to do this with them. Okay, so I talked about all of these things. I just wanna also let you know that we, like whatever technology you have and whatever methods you're excited to use, we actually have all that expertise locally in the SWOG Stat Center. Uh, getting a PhD in this, in statistics or biostatistics, we are excited to learn new things and learn statistics about new technology and new methods for those, either use ones that other people um, have developed or develop our own. So if I were to give this talk in another 10 years, there would be totally different words on this slide because we are like 
coming up with new stuff now. But so that shouldn't be a limitation. Whatever technology you have, we like want to be there with you. Okay, so if I've like encouraged you to say like, oh, I've got these great specific hypotheses and I'm gonna like, now I wanna run with it, so what do I do? Well, so first of all, for that time and effort, so all of us, so these analyses are usually done within committees and within the committees there's a finite, limited number of statisticians and we're humans and this is our job, but we also have to design the trials and monitor them, analyze the primary results, report things to regulatory agencies. We've got a lot going on, including trying to fold in these secondary analyses. So that's where your committee leadership will kind of understand the full portfolio of what's on our effort and, um, and prioritize, essentially. Uh, one thing, though, is that sometimes we don't even need to prioritize it if we can't do it. And so your, your, the committee statistician or the study statistician should be able to answer really quickly if we have the samples and the data needed to answer your hypothesis. Oftentimes I can screen out projects by saying, oh, yeah, you know, that study didn't collect paired samples at baseline and relapse, so like we just don't have it and then we don't need to spend time on it anymore. Or if there's some critical data that are important and we just don't have the data, then we can just stop that and go on and usually we can answer those questions pretty quickly. And this isn't fast. I showed like we've been pretty productive in the, for that like my, 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 my data example, we've been pretty productive but, and I think it's been shown in other plenary sessions, but there's a lot of steps to get samples and everything here is even before I get data and you can end up iterating in some of these steps but there are too many arrows so I didn't show it. But, so one, it's a lot. So have your expectations ready that this could take a while to do. And also, if you can, bring us in early because there have been some projects where the earlier the better, I would say, because we know all the nuances and details of a specific trial and so we can help craft that proposal that really accounts for all of that. While sometimes we get brought in kind of late in the process and it's like too late to fix and now we have uh, a design that doesn't really, a translational medicine design that doesn't really match what the outcome is like hoped to be. So earlier, better. And with that, I'm just gonna thank all the wonderful people I work with. And I'm usually the one with the data, but I wanna thank Patricia Arlaskis, who was the one who helped me get the data for my talk today. And then also, I've had the pleasure to work with these three committees within SWOG for since 2009, and um, I'm excited to keep working with them. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, any questions from the audience or comments? I think we may have a few. Thank you for that. Um, Megan, so I'm Hildy Dillon. I sit on the executive triage committee as the patient advocate. Um, so it was really good to see your presentation. I really appreciate it. One of the questions that often comes up is how many TM requests have we had for a specific study? How are we doing in an amount, if, if they need sample, you know, how much sample do we actually have left? And how do we prioritize? I know that a lot of these studies, you don't necessarily need sample, you're looking at data. But um, when you do need sample, this question comes up often, how do we prioritize if there's real interest in a certain pool of uh, patients? I think that's a really hard question and I'm very grateful that's actually not usually the one that I have to weigh in on. But I should say within the Leukemia Committee, we've had a lot of, those, those papers involve several different translational medicine um, proposals and the committee's really good at, at building on the data that are there and adding to it. But at least within um, my committees, we kind of put it on the committee leadership to put that prioritization. We will provide the tallies, we'll let you know and we can, kind of, you know, put tags on things to say, oh, we've re reserved these, but we've really kind of pushed a lot of that to our um, committee leadership. And I should say, all those papers that I showed, those were all papers within our committee. So they weren't really external people um, and competing 
for that. But that is a really tough, hard question. Yeah. I don't see anybody else at the microphone, which means I can ask really crazy questions. But I want to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see It's you. over here. Hi. I'm an unbiased <laughs> <Great>. statistician. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I, I think that we have some really amazing translational medicine researchers that are part of the group, and, and sometimes they work pretty closely with companies. And, and sometimes they have their own statisticians that they work with at their own institutions. So why should they work with us, even though we had, you have that beautiful list of things that we can do, but why should they work with us <laughs> versus some of their local people? Or maybe they could do both. Okay, I have a couple. I have a couple. Maybe, Mary, you have like your own answer you want to provide if I don't get yours. Um, but, okay, so for one, clinical trials are complicated, and we know all the details of it. So all the nuances of exactly how to analyze the data and account for the design and everything. We know how to do it and we can do it. And we are, and that usually makes us more efficient. I would say 75% of the time when somebody outside of our stats group tries to analyze our data, they do it wrong the first time and maybe the second time and maybe multiple times. And I, you know, it's my job, I will educate them, but also if you had me do it, I would just do it right the first time. Um, and the Hutch in Seattle, like, you guys may not know, but we're, like, really good at statistics and biostatistics. <laughs> so, honestly, it's, like, some of the best people in the world, and no offense, like, wherever, like, we're, we're probably better. So, um, like... <laughs> But I'm, I'm happy to share. So I have lots of stuff to do, you can see. So I'm not like I have to do it all. I'm happy to share. But I do think that we can be more efficient. And like really what this is, is like being stewards of the data, is being efficient and helping as quickly as we can get more research out there to help the next generation of trials. And so, um, yeah. Hi, this Hi. is Takia Tuang. <clears throat> I'm from Kaiser Permanente, and I've worked with Megan before on the Melanoma Committee. But I would like to say, you know, as a community institution who accrues to many of the SWOGS trials, I would feel better if the SWOGS statistician team <laughs> was um, d um, analyzing the data because, you know, all of us participate and put our patients on, and in the end, we hope it the best person will analyze the data and get the answer for us all. Thank you. Thank you. One, one comment is just also you provide honest broker uh, services because uh, all of us want to protect the patient and confidentiality. And if we're an outside institution trying to get uh, data from SWOG, we actually want that protection uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, sort of mislabeling uh, samples, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I say this? Uh, Kathy kicked me as I walked over. <laughs> um, but just two comments. Uh, one is to echo what you said earlier, that uh, I don't know if you all know how spoiled we are. Um, <laughs> this is, we are living with the very best biostatistical support anywhere in the world. We'll never see it. It's like playing for the Lakers, or actually better yet, the Spurs with the Twin Towers. Nothing comes close, nor will it ever be this good again. Well, it may be even better over time. But the, um, the other thing, just to encourage folks, is that do not limit yourself to oncologic outcomes. There are so, the, the, the data are so robust, toxicities, um, entry criteria, other disease processes, and, and over the years I've been impressed that some of those other outcomes, as well as you know, biomarkers that can be embedded in it as well. So just don't li limit it to that because there are other outcomes other than oncologic. Thank you. Other questions, comments, before I make a crazy one. So I, I took some notes. I know you're scared. <laughs> you writing out of the corner <clears throat> of my eye. You're scared. And, and this yeah. is kind of a quote um, or, or 
the summary um, about Megan, you like crazy out of the box thinkers. <laughs> yeah, probably, yes. So rather than doing the routine <laughs> yeah. work and you know what the primary endpoint is and did they hit it or not, but you also like people to, you know. Think, think big, different, creative. Yeah, I'll be all in with you, yeah. So if you don't live in Texas, should you be smoking dope before you, <laughs> you know, conceive a clinical trial? So you're thinking out of the I've had one of those calls, and I, it actually wasn't very constructive. <laughs> <laughs> or I think. I hope you recorded it. You're sitting being like, I think. <laughs> it, it wasn't from me. It wasn't. Um, okay. And you also talked about the percent of trials that come to you either i don't know if it's coming through swag or through your peers at uw but a large percent are not feasible how, yeah. do, how do you handle that well somebody who sits on committees that do mostly trials that people say are infeasible every step of the way, uh, we just try and make it feasible. So that's part of it, is if you're committed to the idea and the first draft isn't feasible, there's probably some version that is feasible. So just being willing to be flexible. So it's both coming back again and again, but also being willing to change and adapt and listen to feedback to make it feasible. Because usually there's something in there um, but sometimes people are just too, they're just committed to like, it's this or nothing, but that isn't gonna be a successful strategy in this sort of network. So, so is it fair for me to paraphrase you and say that um, every request from you should be based on a hypothesis that's backed up by oh data? Oh my God, yes, please. But I do spend time on ones that aren't. So, but I would say, the thing is, if you come in with a specific hypothesis and even some published data that we can like reference, like some 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 of those papers, honestly, Jerry or Sohil or they'll write me a question that's like, do we have this data? And like, look at this paper. And honestly, it's like 30 minutes. We like we have the data, we can look at it, and then we just write the paper. And it, writing the paper takes more than 30 minutes. And like formatting it and sending it in, but it can be. But it's because the question was so specific and they knew enough about the trial and the data sets available that they they were able to ask a question that they were pretty sure and it was so specific. I mean, it just depends, but yes. So, I mean, it's also for the better of SWOG and it's for the better use of it. Like, is, that, is it a better use of my time and the other statisticians' times to be able to be working on things that we can concretely finish in a finite amount of time and get published and move on versus like spinning our wheels forever? So I had, one of my heroes is my chair at the University of Florida when I did my residency and he always said, work within your resources. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you agree yeah, with yeah. that statement? Okay, so you would like him, he's still. Still, still uh, pontificating on that. Any other questions? Okay, that was Thank a you. great session. I hope everyone enjoys the meeting. Again, congratulations and thank you foundation. Congratulations on 30 years of supporting outstanding cancer research and launching the careers of so many people who are in this room. So thank you all, have a great meeting, and let's do some great work.